All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci, and I will be hosting the CosmoQuest Google Hangout Science Hour this evening. Uh, I am a brand new postdoc at uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and I am joined today by my friends uh, Paul Reese, Rachel Beaton, and Ryan Lynch. So everyone wave. Uh, from left to right on the bottom of my screen, we've got Paul and Rachel in, in the same video, and then Ryan is at, uh, at U University of Virginia, and then Ryan is calling in from McGill University, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, astronomy outreach with Dark Skies Bright Kids, uh, which is a program we have all been involved in while uh, grad students at the University of Virginia. And I am going to pause for one second to try and get the link around and make sure we are uh, broadcasting from all the right places. Sorry, God, that's my first one. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourselves uh, and maybe uh, one of you can give an intro to what is Dark Skies Bright Kids. Paul, you want to start? All right. Well, um, I guess I can introduce myself. My name is Paul Reese. I am a uh, sixth year graduate student here at the University of Virginia. Um, I've been with Dark Skies Bright Kids for, I think, about two years now. I, I missed out on the first year. But um, uh, do you want me to start describing the group or just let Rachel introduce herself? Uh, we'll run to Rachel, and then we'll get back to what Dark Skies Bright Kids is. Hi, my name is Rachel Beaton. I'm a fifth-year graduate student here at the University of Virginia, and I've been involved with Dark Skies Bright Kids since it began, but I missed out on the first um, incarnation because of travel. A lot of travel. <laughs> and uh, I'll go next, I guess. I'm Ryan Lynch. I'm a postdoc at McGill University in Montreal, but I was a grad student at the University of Virginia for five years. Um, I left in August of last year, and I was involved in Dark Skies, Bright Kids, up until I left, from, from the beginning of Dark, Dark Skies, Bright Kids, up until the time I left. So I, I left fond, you mean very fond PhD memories and became Dr. Lynch. <laughs> yes, they didn't kick me out. <laughs> I, I left of my, own, of my own free will. <laughs> <coughs> uh, I, I would like to point out that Dr. Dr. Paul Reese also defended his dissertation. Uh, yeah, he's not oh a sixth-year graduate student. I mean, yeah, that's he's, what I'm thinking. He's, 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 a, he's a graduate of the yeah. University of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's not official till like, August 1st for both of us, but right. still. That counts for something. Dr. Gallucci, and, and right? What's that? Dr. Gallucci. Right. Yeah, something like that. And, and Rachel, who's done enough work for three doctors by now. And is that Gail? Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gail Sosowski. Um, hi, Gail. Hello. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, yes, I, I am one of those very old graduate students who hasn't left yet <laughs> at the University of Virginia. Um, and I've been also working with Dark Skies Bright Kids since it started three years ago. Can you say that? Three yeah. years ago. Not as much this year, unfortunately, and I miss it. But Cause she's, She'll be Dr. Zazelski in a couple months. Soon, yeah. Um, so uh, does one of you want to uh, tell us what DSBK, or Dark Skies Bright Kids, is how it got started, um, and maybe the kind of the basic mission of the group. Uh, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> um, so, uh, Dark Skies Bright Kids. Let's see. I have to do some math here. This is its third year. I guess that means it got started in 2009. Um, it was a it was a project that uh, Kelsey Johnson, who's a professor at UVA, came up with. Um, it was part of her NSF career grant, which is a very prestigious um, grant that she had won, award. Um, and basically the idea was to take advantage of the very dark skies in rural Virginia um, and go around to local elementary schools and sort of have an astronomy club that would make astronomy um, and science in general fun for the students and, and, and show them that, you know, it's not just, um, you know, weirdos to sit in a lab all day to do science. It's, it's real people, and we have a good time doing it, and, and to try and get them excited about that. And we were specifically targeting the uh, sort of rural schools around Charlottesville, Virginia, um, because a lot of the students may not necessarily have an opportunity to get exposed 
um, to science um, as much as students who live in the city, especially around the university, um, might have the opportunity to. And, and plus, we had the, the just beautiful dark skies that we could take advantage of for telescope observing as well. So that's where the name and, and, and sort of the whole thing came out of. And then it's just sort of grown and, and really taken off since then um, through the efforts of a lot of really dedicated and talented volunteers. And it's just it's been a really good, pro really good program. Anybody else want to add anything? I mean, I would just add for those uh, people who uh, may not be familiar with the University of Virginia, it's a, located in a city of about 50,000 people, but then surrounded by nothing but country for basically 60 miles in any direction, um, which is why we have this sort of unique opportunity for rural outreach as opposed to a lot of other universities that are located in more urban areas. And are there some kind of dark skies um, restrictions in Albemarle County as well? Yes, uh, I believe that our uh, local county actually, as a result of lobbying by our astronomy department, uh, that <coughs> particularly in the southern part of the county, which is where we've gone uh, for most of our uh, programs, there's actually um, uh, restrictions on what type of outdoor lighting people can use for their houses so that uh, it doesn't interfere with uh, the astronomy. Cool, cool. Right, we have um, Fan Mountain Observatory in that area, uh, which is our... our our. I keep saying our. <laughs> I'm not at UVA anymore, which is UVA's research telescopes. Um, cool. And uh, what, one of the things that's, I think, really cool about DSBK is you see the same kids every week. Mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of building that, that mentorship through the club. Um, does, do you want to talk about some of the activities that uh, DSBK does with the clubs? Do we have any yeah. examples? Sure. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> we do a number of different activities, and uh, we have sort of themed activities. Um, our favorite being comets and rockets, um, and those are also the perennial favorites of the kids as well. Um, so with comets, we actually build a physical model of a comet using dirt and Windex and dry ice and um, corn, corn syrup. syrup. Don't forget regular ice. And regular water. ice and water. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, we also make or make an edible comet with ice cream, Oreos, chocolate syrup, and um, liquid nitrogen. Yeah, but just <laughs> but the liquid nitrogen is evaporated by the time the kids eat it because yes. right. <laughs> 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 um, and then our other favorite is rockets, which is Paul's special. Right, and we've actually have several different varieties of rockets we use with the kids depending on what we want to do. Um, we've the, the main rocket thing that we've done with pretty, almost every club that we've done so far is basically we buy, you know, these little uh, Estes model rocket kits. They cost like $7 or something, fairly inexpensive. And they put these rockets together and we launch them and they go, you know, 100 feet in the air and everyone goes, yay, yay, rockets. Um, but we have a couple of other rocket activities we do th that are uh, a little more, uh, that you don't learn too much from building a kit because, uh, I mean, it's basically, you, you, well, just following directions, which right. can be a challenge, granted, with uh, <laughs> small children, but, um, the, but you're, you're not actually learning about science uh, in that regard. And so the other rocket activities we have are, there's a, um, uh, one time we, we tried to make homemade cardboard rockets, which um, was an interesting adventure because uh, the, the uh, skill required to assemble them was uh, somewhat more challenging Beyond yeah. most of the graduate students. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it also resulted in variable construction quality, shall we say, such that we only one or two rockets. They blew up. <laughs> fire. They on fire. They no, wait. Oh, okay. Okay. That's okay. Right. Yeah, you're right. have one explode. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I missed that week. Yeah, that sounds fun. It, it is. Um, and then the other rocket activity we do is uh, with bottle rockets, using basically a, a bike pump and a two liter bottle of soda and apparatus for launching them. Uh, and it's u interesting to do that because then you get to talk about um, well, sort of the, the various factors that go into uh, what makes a rocket get propelled because you can trade off between using air and water as fuel and you can also trade off on how much pressure you use and you explain how that's sort of equivalent to you know, how much mass you throw out and what velocity you throw out that mass out at, which is the, the main principle behind how a real rock rocket works. You can also let the kids pump the pressure into the bottles, which makes them feel like they're doing something. They're a part <laughs> of the experiment. Um, 
Yeah, uh, I just want to break in really quickly for anyone who's just joining uh, to the CosmoQuest Science Hour. We're talking about uh, Astronomy Hour each with a group in Central Virginia called Dark Skies Bright Kids, or DSBK, uh, run out of the University of Virginia Department of Astronomy. Some of us are wearing the t-shirt. So. <laughs> um, so what kind of um, what kind of things do you, what kind of feedback have you gotten from students and teachers and parents? Um, and it, DSPK is so far pretty much focused on third, fourth, and fifth graders. So what kind of feedback have you gotten from the program? The most direct feedback we've gotten is that we tend to cycle between a series of schools that are in southern Albemarle County, and generally when we go to a school a second time, um, we haven't been restricting um, enrollment in the club to students who haven't been in the club before. And we'll have a large number of the students we saw the year before will sign up again. Um, so we see the same kids over and over again who are really excited um, to, to work with us and be in the program. Um, also, whenever you see the kids around town, they're really excited to see you and they run up and hug you. And um, that's always <coughs> good to see because we really want to become their mentors and their big brothers and their big sisters in science. Um, in terms of feedback from <coughs> you know, uh, schools, uh, we have vastly more requests than we have um, time. Time <laughs> <laughs> volunteers. Yeah. Um, then we are able to accommodate. Um, so we feel like we are serving a need in the community um, that's being met, and we are advertising to the community that we're here. Um, and also, we receive so much support from the principals um, and the school board. Actually, um, commendations on our work, and we recently received um, an award from the <laughs> Science and Math uh, Coalition of Virginia, which is the highest award for this type of outreach award work in Virginia, um, called a program that works um, <coughs> based on you know our, our track record and what we're doing. And, and so we we have feedback from different sources, and we think we're doing all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say program that work is like the highest. Um, to me, that's like the highest honor you can get because it's like you're doing stuff that's important. So that, that's really yeah. cool. Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, I was just going to add the uh, the other evidence that that our program works is that every single one of the schools that we we've been to um, has uh, been very active in encouraging us to return. We and actually <laughs> get lobbied by the schools. It's like a little battle that yes. plays out over email <laughs> over where we're going to go um, each semester. Awesome, um, Ryan. You, uh, you and I have have left the, the UVA family, um, and so what kind of things from what, what from your experience at DSBK have you brought on to your your life as a postdoc? Yeah. So actually, um, sort of in general, real just love of of outreach, and specifically working with that age group because I think that that's where you have. With, with sort of elementary school kids up through as, as far as high school, I think that's where you have an opportunity to sort of make the biggest impact. Because when you get towards college or, or, or doing outreach with adults, it's good to sort of educate the public about astronomy and about science. Um, but, but these are people who have largely already decided what they're going to do with their lives. And that's great. Not everyone is going gonna, is gonna to become an astronomer or a scientist, but it's always really rewarding to see students get interested in this kind of thing. And you hope that somewhere down the road they'll they'll sort of turn that into maybe a career. You know, not if, if not in astronomy, then in, then in a field um, that's related to sort of science and technology, which, which I think is, is important just for sort of society in general in some sort of grand philosophic sense and, and maybe more concrete dollars and cents as well. Yeah. Um, but also in, in a more specific way, so being involved with uh, DSBK when I got here to McGill, um, Myself and it's been a group effort. There's a lot of other people who are involved with with this um, are trying to sort of build an outreach program here. And so one of the things that we're actually going to be doing um, a week from tomorrow is our first sort of science day at one of the local elementary schools here in Montreal. Um, and so it's it's sort of a DSBK like sort of thing. It's just a one time event for now, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to maybe do something more regular. There's a lot of schools in Montreal. Um, they don't have dark skies here that you have in Central Virginia. Um, so we'll have to think of a different name. Um, there's a lot of, there's yeah. a lot of the schools that we uh, that we could certainly go to. Um, so I don't know if it'll ever become something quite like the SPK where we go to one school all the time. But I'm hoping that we'll we'll generate interest and that we'll be able to uh, 
to do this sort of thing very often up here. And so we're going to be doing uh, comets, um, no rockets, because the school is a little bit wary of that. Um, but we'll be doing some other activities, um, invisible light with UV sensitive beads, and uh, which is one of my favorites. Um, I love that one. Yeah, and, and a few others. So, and, and one of the cool things up here is that so Montreal um, is in Quebec, which is a, a um, it's a very bilingual city. There's a French and an English school system, and so I don't speak French, but a lot of the grad students and postdocs at McGill who are helping with this um, speak French, and so. Um, we'll be doing this hopefully in both the French and the English school systems. So we'll be um, sort of bringing it to even more people that way. Very That's cool. our hope. So. Well, speaking of bilingual, um, DSPK has a book along those lines. Maybe Rachel, you can tell us more a little about that. Yeah, we have an art book. Um, it's a book that has artwork that was actually made on on paper, not with a computer, um, and glued together. Um, the project started as a way to connect to a bilingual student that we had in our original club because we were having a, a difficult time um, getting her to sort of come out of her shell. Mm -hmm. but, um, so one of our volunteers, who was an undergraduate at the time, uh, made all of this art. And she, um, with, another, with the help of a grad student, Jillian Carlberg, who's now at uh, the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism with the Bear Rubin Fellowship, um, they put together some text in Spanish and in English. Laura did the original translation um, to help explain some of the concepts that we were trying to teach in our class. And that sort of snowballed into a full-out book um, that's made with a digital layout. And um, actually, right now in the background, where we are now... Do you um, want to just turn the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pule and students, uh, Loreto and Guillermo, are actually working <laughs> on the of the translation because the final draft of the book is due to the printer uh, tomorrow. So, <laughs> in true graduate student fashion, we're pushing the deadline. Um, but we're really excited. The plan is to bring that book um, and to debut the 2000, 2012 edition, which is it's expanded from our original draft at the AAS meeting, or the American Astronomical Society meeting in Anchorage, Alaska, which is, starts June 10th. So we'll be there with a some copies of the book to hand out to educators. Do we have a link to the book on our website? Could we? Uh, no, the PDF okay. is not on our website. Okay. Um, yeah, are there plans to put it on the website once it's potentially? Finished? We're actually um, in and that depends on funding. Sort of negotiations right now with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and the National Optical Astronomy Observatories um, for them to actually pick up the book and distribute it in Tucson and in Chile. So. How we're distributing the book depends a little bit on where the uh, funding comes from, but our hope and our goal is that we can give it free of cost to as many people as we can. And we're focusing a lot on Virginia, um, but to put it on our website where anyone can access it. Um, so we're working on that pretty actively. There is some information about the book online. Yeah, I just posted a link to the DSBK website in the comments if anyone wants to check it out. Um, just the general website for the group. Um, what kind of what other resources are available to the public um, through the website? So the public beyond Virginia. Uh, one thing we've been trying to get better about, um, both for our own sake and the sake of other people, is writing up what we do in the forms of lesson plans that tell you, you know, the purpose of the lesson, the material you need, and basically everything you need to do to conduct uh, the lesson without having ever <laughs> met any one of us. Um, uh, we, we haven't put uh, as many online as we would, would like yet, but we've got at least uh, three or four of them uh, available that you can... Uh, you yeah, can I think uh, Georgia, Georgia Bracey, who also works at SIUE on CosmoQuest, um, is asking if the edible comet recipe is online, and I think that one is posted. Uh, yes. yes, there it is. Yes, it is. Yes. The edible comet is online. Do you want to put a link to our lesson plan page as well? Sure. Can you just do that? No. Yeah. Rachel, you I'll have typing abilities. <laughs> I'll chime in and say that as we get uh, into this more up here at McGill, we will be posting similar sorts of things, and they'll be in both French and English. Um, so I don't know how many people listening um, working are in French-speaking areas, but that'll be a uh, resource as well. And yeah, the yeah, so the uh, the uh, the book that is right now in English and Spanish. There's also plans. Um, working with uh, Greg Sivakov, who is at um, University 
of Alberta, Alberta. Um, to distribute a French-English version as well. So that's something that's in the works. So, yeah, the, the French translation is complete. It just um, needs to be plugged into the book. So we'll have that as well. Excellent. I didn't know we had the translation already. Cool. Yep. And it's been vetted. It has been vetted. It's actually French. <laughs> it's actually what we wanted to say in French. <laughs> yes, and, and multiple French people have read it and confirmed. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, what can can each of you chime in with something that? Um, so we all started. A lot of the DSPK volunteers are um, undergrads, grad students, and postdocs at the University of Virginia, uh, and so that's typically our heads are in research projects. Um, so is there something about doing DSBK that surprised you or that, that you learned from it that was really invaluable? Um, so I can start. So you mentioned that our heads are in research projects. Maybe they're not quite in, in the research projects as much as our advisors would have liked because of DSBK. <laughs> um, but but I got all, so I got a lot of support from my advisor, and I think other people have as well because they recognize that it's a really important thing. Um, you know, I, I think that astronomy, so the public is really interested in astronomy, um, and so I think that education is one of the things that we can sort of give back to the public, since most of our funding comes from the public. I think that's an important thing to do. Um, so people recognize that it's important, and, and there was, was support for that. Um, and so for me, um, by doing stuff with DSBK and with other outreach programs, it sort of uh, showed me just how much I like doing outreach, and so ultimately, down the road, however many years from now, when I, when I try and actually find a, a sort of permanent job, I would like to make sure that um, education and outreach is a really significant component of that. So it, it's sort of just reaffirmed for me how much I enjoy doing that sort of thing, and so that was one of the lessons I took away from it, I guess. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so I grew up out in the middle of nowhere on a farm, and you know, being on a farm, you're actually pretty close to science because you're, you're planting things, you're growing things. Um, and so what I sort of realized going to the schools was that not everyone has that sort of deeply embedded science background in life, um, but everyone is, is curious. Um, and I was very fortunate to be able to explore my curiosity um, at a very young age. And I think we provide a very, very powerful service to go to these kids and permit them to be curious and have fun with learning, and more importantly, to have fun with science. And I didn't, you know, because of my specific background, perhaps, um, I didn't really realize how other people didn't have, you know, that experience of, of being able to, to explore the world around them and do things of that nature. So I think, you know, as, as part of DSBK, it's really reaffirmed, you know, that we need to do this kind of work and make sure that, you know, the public as a whole are getting learn are learning about science and what science is and that you can be a scientist just by, um, you know, doing experiments in your school's backyard. Um, science is anything you do that's sort of exploring a topic, not just the stuff that we do in our thesis. I, I think that uh, DSBK is also really important because it teaches us that, that you know, we, we sit in these universities which are, well, we're a little bit sheltered from what goes on in the world here and there, but um, it's a good way of giving back and making sure that we're actually part of the communities that we live in, that we're not just uh, you know, we're not just closeted, and so it gives us a chance to sort of um, understand where, uh, what, what people are learning about science and what ways that we can sort of improve uh, people's understanding of how, how science works and what scientists do, um, because there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about what, what makes a scientist a scientist, and I think it's very important uh, sure. that we... Yeah. Oh, no, can you... Oh, sorry. okay. Um, I mean, I, I personally mostly got involved because I wanted uh, an excuse to, to, to not do research at least one day a week. Um, <laughs> and the fact that, that our fearless leader, Bryce, with uh, free food doesn't uh, help her either. But, um, but the, the giving back to the community, I think, is a very important part of what we do, if not the most important. I think Kelsey Johnson, who uh, yeah, started DSPK, learned that if you give grad students carbs, they will do anything. Yeah. So one thing uh, I learned when giving a, a presentation um, in the fall is that if you actually Google science, if you Google image scientist, um, and you look at the images, oh, the stereotype no. that you get is um, older white male with Einstein-like hair, wearing a lab coat, 
holding chemicals. Um, there's maybe <laughs> he looks pretty crazy in most of those pictures too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I mean, you can do that at home and, and look. And so that stereotype is is quite disturbing because um, that's definitely not what all scientists do. And so one thing we actually do is have students at the beginning of our club um, draw what they think a scientist does. And it is almost identical to these images, um, mostly male, always with chemicals, always wearing a lab coat as yeah. well. Um, but by the end of the course, and, and what I think is most remarkable about Dark Skies Bright Kids and the type of program that we run, the kids actually draw themselves at the end. And they're all looking through telescopes, but that's just because of uh, immersion. But um, they're at least drawing themselves and seeing themselves in these roles instead of seeing the strange white male with crazy hair. So See, none of us have crazy hair. We're all scientists. <laughs> yes. Lesson. <laughs> well, I used to have crazy hair, but yeah, yeah there's some crazy hair. In, in but I don't think that that was a correlation with me being a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> that was just more college. <laughs> we have some grad students with crazy hair. A few. So. Yes. I think some of us have gone through crazy hair phases. Yeah, we're yes. not going to bring that up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part, the uh, bad scientist stereotype is not true. But it still persists with the kids. I remember at the beginning of the club, we just started this semester, one of the kids drew us, when doing the scientists, uh, some of you may be familiar with um, a show called Phineas and Ferb, and they drew the evil Dr. Heinz Doofenshmirtz as their picture of what a scientist looks like. So, <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully we change that over the course of the semester. Now the platypus is a scientist, right? No, the platypus is a hero, not a scientist. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, scientists are heroes, too. That's true. That's true. Come on. <laughs> So do you guys have anything to show and tell? Well, I did bring um, a few of these little fellas. Um, so for every school that we go to, um, in order to, to sort of make it easier to interact with the children, we get a mascot related to whatever their school mascot is. And it turns out pretty much every school has a mascot of some sort. Um, we have quite a selection of them here. This is our oldest mascot. Um, I should put that, on, yeah, this, his name is Pluto Little Dippy. Uh, you might ask, where do the names come from? Uh, well, the answer is we actually let the kids make up the names for uh, the mascots themselves. And they're although we strongly encourage an astronomical theme of some sort, uh, there's quite a, a, a latitude in what they can choose. So this guy's named Pluto Little Dippy, Pluto being the obvious, Little Dippy being Little Dipper. So anyway. Yes, and in that case, I think they couldn't decide on a name. So you yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We do it democratically. Everyone votes. Um, yeah, he is a panther, even though he, I don't know. Pluto's gone to, um, I am, I've taken Pluto to a shuttle launch at Kennedy. Uh, he's been all over the world with some of the other grad students. Where, where else has Pluto yeah. been? Pluto's been photographed with the head of the American Astronomical Society as well, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Oh, and Jocelyn Bell, right? Yep, the he met Jocelyn Bell, who was the discoverer of pulsars when I went to a uh, conference in Sardinia, Italy. So one thing that we've done is very excited. <laughs> a lot of us travel quite often um, and we'll take the mascot with us when we travel or a mascot now that we have so many um, you can pretty much have your choice um, and we'll photograph the mascot wherever we are and sort of it, like a traveling garden gnome thing. Yeah. yeah and so when we come back um, we can tell the students where we were we can show them the mascot and what I find um, so remarkable about the mascots is that it gives you a perfect um, scale marker when you're standing at some of these amazing um, places like the large binocular telescope. Uh, when you look at a picture, it doesn't seem that big, but when you actually have a mascot to show them you know, next to that telescope, you get a really good understanding for how big it is. It also is a nice icebreaker whenever you're going anywhere um, in the airport or you know, <laughs> at an observatory to have a stuffed animal on your back because everyone thinks... Um, you're a little crazy, and so they ask you why you have it, um, and then you get to you know talk about your program. And I've made a lot of connections with astronomers and other people in the Charlottesville community just at the airport with a T-shirt wearing stuffed animal in my backpack. Yeah. Oh yeah, show the T-shirt. Well, Nancy has made the T-shirt. Oh, not that one. Oh, that's different. Well, okay. Yeah, hold on. We've got um, meteor okay. shower here. That, that, that's the very large, it's a t-shirt from the very large array, but I was thinking of this one, yeah. So this turn turn media around. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Branding, baby. They get pins and other markers of the different places that they've been. Um, Is that a scarf? Is that new? Yeah, um, Whitney knitted yeah. a scarf when we were at the, um, 
when you're at Kit Peak. That's so cute. Is Buzz not there? Buzz not was my favorite. Not, I think we. I can go searching for him if you want. But no, that's fine. That's fine. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I we're think going to Buzz not as a as a B for um, Yancy. He's a yellow jacket. He's a yellow jacket yeah, for so Yancy. Yancy yellow jacket. I think all of the B's are with our materials for the club. Oh, okay. Because that one used to sit on my lap while I was finishing my dissertation. <laughs> I, I think we've all spent a fair amount of time with the mascot yes. <laughs> outside of Dark Skies Break. Yes. Um, I will ask each of you to um, maybe give any final thoughts about DSBK and outreach in general. And um, while I also ask anyone who's, I see some people are watching, if you can plus one this uh, or thumbs up or like or whatever YouTube has going on right now. Um, a plus one us on Google Plus, and uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the comments at this time on the Google Plus page, and we will take them. But while I'm waiting for questions, um, maybe we can go around and, and say some final thoughts about DSPK and outreach. Paul, uh, tag it. Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, I mean. I think Dark Skies Brace Kids is a remarkable program in that we serve a demographic that's not traditionally served by most outreach programs because most outreach programs go where all the people are and admittedly that's easier to do than go where no one is but um, the people out in the country are therefore less likely to have a program like this and so it's really good uh, that we do this on a regular basis and so reach a group that might otherwise uh, be left behind out of the um, uh, the, the science community. And the fact is that we've been going strong now for um, almost three years. And Six seasons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so and we've been to, and, and just that um, it's, it's incredible to be working with this group as we've expanded from two schools our first year to this year, I think we've been to like three or four or five different mm -hmm. We've had as many contact yeah. hours <laughs> this year as we had last year, just in the first five months of the year. Yeah. Well, not just school clubs, but also one-off programs. Right. I know you recently right. did some um, one in Stanton, I think. No, or that's uh, sa Saturday. Saturday. Yes. Oh, okay, that's coming up. Yes, indeed. Cool, Rachel. Any last thoughts? Yeah. Um. Oh, it went away. Um. <laughs> back. Um, Too many things in your head. Okay, that there. <laughs> um, yeah, I think <laughs> I think doing outreach and especially doing this type of outreach is the best avenue to train you know educators, um, whether they be high school educators or um, college educators, because if you can explain something to a room of third graders um, who don't know all the social you know normalcies of not shouting at you when you say something they don't understand or making faces at you or throwing something at you. Um, you can pretty much explain something to anyone and so you really get to test your chops and your ability to communicate just being in these classrooms and I think that's really valuable not just from the students perspective of realizing that scientists are normal people and that scientists do actually care about the world around them but it's also very beneficial for the graduate students and the undergraduate students and the postdocs because they get to practice communicating and taking their science um, or whatever science they happen to be teaching um, to new and different audiences and I think that makes us better teachers and educators and even better scientists in the end because communication is the real crux of our, of our field. Yeah, Ryan? Um, well they already kind of said almost everything. Um, so I'm sorry. Is, no, that's fine. I mean, it, so, so, I, mean everything, I, I agree with everything they said and um, I sort of said myself a little bit earlier that you know, I think that um, as astronomers sort of one of the most useful things that we can give back to society is sort of education and, and hopefully a love of science because when people ask me as an astronomer uh, well that's really interesting but um, how is it like you know affect my everyday life if I'm being honest I have to most of the time say well it really doesn't astronomy is yeah. mostly not, not completely but mostly curiosity driven science which is great I mean I, I feel strongly that that's a good thing but um, you know it's nice to be able to say you know, here, here's a real tangible sort of benefit, um, which is good. And so, and also, just personally, when I was in DSBK, one of the things I really liked was um, I kind of felt like I was part of these communities. I mean, these are sort of small schools, rural communities. They tend to be sort of tight-knit. 
And although I lived in Charlottesville and these places aren't that far away, but they but they but they're distinct, I sort of felt like I became part of the, the local communities, and that felt really good you know, to have that sort of sense of belonging. Um, so that was something that, that I really enjoyed as well. In addition to all the other stuff that that Paul and Rachel and you and Nicole have already said. Yeah, yeah um, def they, we would uh, see the parents as well. Um, at least once a semester, um, we try and do a family observing night, taking advantage of the actual dark skies, right? Um, and so the kids will get excited, and why is there a dog staring at me? The kids <laughs> will be, get excited and bring their parents. Um, so you get to meet the parents, and um, they're just as interested in, in looking through the telescopes as the kids are really good to see the kids get really excited in front of their parents and showing their parents what they've learned mm -hmm. and then you really know that you've, you've got that one. Yeah. And, yeah. and one of the other things about the program that I mean perhaps we, we I mean it's we sort of implied it but maybe not mentioned it directly is the fact that you know people can you know drive to visit an observatory but with our program we actually bring like an observatory or a planetarium to them so that it's it, it saves. It, it's a money-saving thing, both for the schools and for uh, the the parents, in that it, it makes it much easier for them to access this, those things they wouldn't have access to otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And, cool. and the planetarium. We we have a, a Starlow planetarium that we can take just about anywhere, um, which is an amazingly expensive piece of equipment, but it's <laughs> worth every penny because it's <laughs> it's an amazing piece of equipment. In fact, um, I'm a I'm in a fellowship program here at, at UVA, and I, I did an event for the other graduate students. Um, and some of them counted that event as one of the formative experiences of their <laughs> of their year, because just laying back in the planetarium and going anywhere, you know, in the local universe, you know, at the the drop of a hat is actually one of the most amazing experiences you can have. I mean, we do it in our heads all the time, but <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, and, and you guys have totally hacked the Starlab code to um, make your own shows uh, and whatnot. So we've really put that code through its uh, through its paces. Yeah, you don't even have to have the code. You can just yeah, you just go here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so how can people contact DSBK, help DSBK, or be helped by DSBK? Well, if <laughs> All of those things can um, come through our, our email address, which is dsbk at astro, A-S-T-R-O, dot Virginia, dot edu, um, which is also on our website. Um, as far as, you know, helping DSBK, uh, we run on <laughs> shoestring is a stretch of a budget. Um, we've actually received a lot of help from various grants, um, which has allowed us to purchase materials that we have. Um, but um, our funding is limited, and we're, we're quite worried about it at this point. Um, so we we do we have um, been set up as a recognized sort of organization at the university and can accept tax deductible donations. Um, we also have an Amazon wish list. Mm, yes. So you can actually you know send us a rocket kit if you'd like. They are very expensive. Yeah. So you can buy rockets for for these kids in in Albemarle County to use to learn science with and get all excited about science. Yeah, getting DSBK um, to come to your school, um, there's actually a form on our website that we like for um, people to fill out, um, which collects the information we need to try and schedule you. Yeah. Um, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to, to go anywhere, but we try to um, answer as many yeah. requests as possible. I mean, anywhere more or less within about an hour's drive of Charlottesville, we're yeah. more than willing to, to try and make right. it work. Um, um, we, do, we do tend to, we offer our services free to the rural elementary schools, um, um, but we do ask for some in-kind donations for certain events that we do, um, depending on the um, the event. Um, yeah. um, one thing, the other way you can get back uh, get back from DSBK is again we have these lesson plans that we've put online. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're an educator or uh, or just a parent and you're interested in, in the activities for your children to do, um, we have. You're more than welcome to use our lesson plans. That's what they're there for. And again, uh, encourage you to have a look at our website, look them over, download them, and do what you will with them. Yeah. And we're happy to answer any questions, or if there's a concept that you would like to teach, we might have a, um, a lesson plan that we are sort of working on but haven't put up on the website yet um, that we might be able to help you with. 
Um, we really like to reach out to teachers because we want teachers to make sure that they realize that doing these astronomy lessons and these physics lessons um, is possible to do in their classroom even with third graders. And they're fun. They're a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I think if, if, if anyone out there um, wants to start their own outreach program in their town for schools, um, I mean, it really just was a grassroots kind of thing for us. Um, and so going to that website um, that I put a link to in the, in the comments, um, going to that website, you can kind of get some starting resources and kind of learn from our, our fits and starts um, to, to start your own <laughs> effort. Yeah, I mean, we, we try not to put any lesson plans on the website that require um, special toys. Yes. Um, our lesson plans that are on the website all are things that you can get fairly easy either through Amazon or through at your grocery store, really, everything else, I think. Yeah. And it, again, we operate mostly on a shoestring budget, and so most of our activities are designed around things that you can do on a shoestring budget. Or things that you can do cost efficiently with 500 students. Yes, that too. Excellent. All right, um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. I'm going to hit refresh one more time just to check. Um, doo -dee -doo -dee -doo. Can so I put a I shameless plug in real quick while we're on the topic? Yes, please do. Yeah? Okay. Do. So if you're <coughs> also in, if you're in Canada or in, the, or in the Montreal area and you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, um, you can go um, to www.astro.physics.mcgill.ca and you'll see a link for outreach. You'll find contact information for our outreach group there. And we're also on Facebook, um, Astrophysics at McGill University, so you can follow us there. Um, like I said, right now we're sort of focusing on Montreal, but if there's a lot of interest um, from someplace else in the area, then I'm more than happy to try and uh, travel a bit and organize something there as well. Okay, and shameless plug. Sorry, I had to do that. No, that's totally okay. Um, in fact, if you could put that link in the, um, in the in the, the chat comments, not in the chat, in the comments. In the comments. Of the public. So I will I will post. <laughs> hang on, we have several things open. I will post a link to the public comments in our private chat, and so you can post a link there. Uh, I see uh, Timothy Legauer has also posted a link to where you can donate money to Dark Skies Bright Kids because <laughs> he's awesome uh, and is very supportive of our effort. Oh, Thank you, Tim. There's a few questions. Oh, oh, we do have questions. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Tell me what it is. Um, well, one is, what's your ratio of boys to girls? Which I'd say, uh, are, is that in terms of, I don't know, in terms of volunteers or in terms of... Uh, oh, I see it. Our... Uh, oh. Uh, the demographic that we serve, it's, it's pretty even-handed in both cases. Um, yeah, the boys are, are taking a lead now, again, yeah. in the volunteers. It used to be very female-driven, and now it's we're almost even. Yeah. Um, and uh, with the club, I'd say we usually have slightly more males than females, but not by right. a huge margin, like maybe 60-40. Is, isn't it mostly girls this time? Uh, again? No. No, it's about even. Oh, uh, no, you're right. It was, yeah, right. Yeah. I, I was only there the, the first week, right. so. Yeah, no, we had a couple more girls show up in yeah. subsequent. Yeah. Okay, cool. But the other question was... Oh, yeah, Georgia also asked, do you have a sense that the kids take this experience back to their families, and do they seek out other science experiences because of DSBK? I so think they definitely take it back to their families. Um, one of the things that I think was really cool to see was that the... Uh, the family observing nights that the parents and the kids were interacting. Um, the kids were telling them about what they learned. Um, and I think it's really great because you can do everything that you want in a classroom setting, but, but if you really want to reinforce sort of um, good learning habits and, and that sort of thing, then it really helps to have support in the home as well. And so, so yeah, I think that we definitely saw that kind of interaction when we had the parents around. Yeah, um, we have some quotes from the parents. They should be on our website somewhere. Um, you know, and, and one of them being that, that they were driving home from some event at some point and the girls were looking out the window and they started talking about constellations and telling stories and then they started talking about planets and then they started talking about black holes and gravity and all these other things and that the parents found that absolutely amazing. They don't think all the concepts were exactly right but they do think that they were just amazed that all these words and concepts stuck with them and really invigorated their kids with this um, you know, love of science and love of learning, really. Um, and we do see our kids um, in different facets. We go to a lot of um, local science events, 
in the Charlottesville area. Um, we have a lovely Discovery Museum here in Charlottesville, and we see yeah, some of our same. <laughs> yeah, we see some of our same kids. We actually see parents who want us, you know, to come and, and do all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, and we've heard from the principals at the schools that they hear a lot of really positive things from the parents themselves. Um, we're supported mostly by um, um, PTOs and things like that. So. Yeah. And we've, we're working here at UVA, and I think other schools are, are probably working at this as well. We're actually working at bringing all of the different science and engineering um, STEM type outreach groups that are all across the university, bring them together so we can share contact lists, so that we can hopefully maybe even build a rotation with a lot of these schools where the chemistry group goes, the astronomy group, the math group, etc. Um, so that's in the works. Um, slowly working. Uh, a lot of this is also being led by graduate students who are just really passionate about outreach. Um, so it, it, it works in fits and starts depending on how the thesis work is going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all giggle nervously. <laughs> uh, Georgia has another good question. Did you guys feel nervous before you did any outreach or did it come naturally to you? Uh, I think for most of us the, the outreach, I, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess the first time before you start any new outreach program, you're 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 always nervous. But I think most of us, uh, a lot of people that come to UVA come from a background where they've already had experience with outreach, and I think that's true of most of us that have been involved in the Dark Skies Bright Kids program. Uh, and so I don't think I think most of us are actually not that nervous about the the doing outreach, but we might be specifically nervous about. Well, so the mo we have a motto for our club, which is <laughs> <laughs> which is monitor and adjust, because we discovered that pretty much anything that we plan will go right out the window within the first five minutes of contact at the club when something doesn't yeah, go right. Yeah, we we've just but. learned that you can't, you know, there's this there's this happy space somewhere in the middle of planning way too much and planning not at all that you want to try and go because things <laughs> never go as you expect. Yes. Um, some of our students, or some of the graduate students I think who, who don't do as much um, outreach, I don't know that they're necessarily nervous like doing the lesson that they're supposed to do, but we've noticed we do have some difficulty with um, discipline sometimes yeah. because yeah. Um, we aren't really always interpreted as being the adult. So Kelsey Johnson, our director, who goes to almost every single club, who's now an associate professor here at UVA, um, you know, just has this amazing ability to, you know, command the students. And we decided it's because she looks like a mom. She, she is of, a mom. She is a mom, and she looks like a mom, and she talks like a mom. Whereas we as students sort of talk more like kids or, or, or a little bit. Yeah. So we actually, um, we, we have a, a saying which is called, you have, to, you have to be the alpha in the room. And this is Kelsey's mo motto for how she, you know, how she feels when she's being a parent. Um, it, it's kind of like the dog whisperer. Um, <laughs> where it, if you stand in front of the room and you're confident and you're talking to them and you're on top of things, um, they follow you innately because um, yeah. kids, kids at this age really, really want and need structure. Um, and so we learned that sort of on the flies that we have to keep things very structured. And as long as you're confident standing in front of the group, they will follow you and listen to you. But the minute you show some sort of hesitation, they they will jump on you and eat your life. Yeah, yeah. There's a struggle <laughs> ensues between you and and then the kid who's yeah. Yeah, but um, that and that I think we, we found is one of the more difficult things um, to do, and, and you can get sort of until you sort of master that ability, it, it can be kind of a challenge. I think that was my 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 same problem too. Is I could ramble about science all day long. I was okay with that aspect, but you know, trying to corral a group of children because um, you know none of us are trained as most of the rest most of us aren't trained as teachers. We may have one or two education students oh, right. around here. So we, we, yeah, that was the first thing we had to learn um, was how to corral children. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And and one thing we've all these different schools. Each school has its own sort of culture for discipline, I guess. Um, and most of them actually have some sort of. This is so much like w with dogs. Um, some sort of action that you do or symbol. Some of them it's raising a hand. Some of them it's a clapping rhythm that they do that is supposed to be get yourself together and bring it bring yourself back into the group 
Um, so going to different schools like we do, we actually have to sort of learn their way of doing discipline every, every place we go, which can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, one of the most awesome is that at Yancey, the school we're going to now, they actually have a self-initiated timeout system. So it's yeah. called, I need a break. And so the kids will get sort of riled up or they'll get upset about something and they just stop or sometimes you have to remind them. But they go to this one spot in the school, I think there's like a carpet square, and they just stand there or have to stay there until they've calmed down and, and collected themselves and then they can come back to the classroom, um, which, you know, I think we use in our, in the department now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, really? I, I, we need a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. First time I, I, I asked a kid to take a break, I felt so horrible because I, you know, remember being a kid and being put in timeout, and I'm like, well, ah, I'm going to destroy them. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. But it, it is a lot better concept than timeout, the take a break yeah. spot. So Tim was asking how much time do we actually spend? Yeah, clearly he wants to get us in trouble with our advisors. <laughs> yeah. Um, by asking that question, so I played the fifth. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm just going to say that, that when we, uh, I mean, each individual club, the typical day, if we're doing a club, is uh, driving there and back, depending on, is usually about an hour because the schools are fairly far away. Um, and then the actual club itself usually lasts between um, one and about two and a half hours. Um, although there are sometimes extra activities, like if we're doing observing with the families or whatever that night, it can go a bit longer. So that's, that's sort of the weekly commitment. We have a bunch of volunteers so that not all of us have to go every week. And so there's, I mean, we, we did the calculation about how many hours we put in, and we prefer not to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly during, when you're developing a lesson plan, um, you can think a couple of days really into putting things together, testing different ways to do it, um, doing it, doing it again, doing it when you're tired, um, all those kinds of things to try and figure out the lesson plan. Um, but we're sort of getting ourselves down into a fairly well-oiled machine to where um, we have a weekly planning meeting that can run anywhere from a half hour to two hours, <laughs> um, depending on what's coming up. And then we sort of split off into subgroups. Um, I've been doing a lot more administration this year than actually going to clubs. Um, and so, you know, I'll maybe spend an hour organizing what needs to go for the week, which saves some time for the volunteers who actually spend more time going there. Um, and so we're working a lot on organizing ourselves. We're working more closely with the staff in our department, for instance, who can handle calling the schools, checking on um, administrative type things, um, which is really helping us. Um, we've gotten some volunteers you know, in other departments who aren't necessarily astronomers who kind of can help behind the scenes. Someone helps us a lot with our website. Um, he's in our IT department at UVA. Allie! Yeah! yeah. Um, <laughs> and we are sort of, you know, trying to be actively engaged in, in using people's strengths. Not everyone's really good at being in front of a classroom, but, you know, everyone has something they can do. Um, you know, like we've, in, we've engaged our, our Chilean comrades in, in helping us with the book. Um, so, yeah. Um, there were a few more questions in the chat. Um, yeah, um, maybe we should end on, on this one from Georgia. What is your wildest outreach story? Wildest Ryan, do you want to start? I, <laughs> do I want to start? No, not really. No, okay, no. Um, <laughs> wildest outreach story, let's see. I have to think about this a little bit probably. Well, um, while you guys think, there was an interesting question. It's like the last one, which yeah. is whether or not we've tried some of our activities with older kids. Yeah. Um, the the straightforward answer is is no, but the the more correct answer is to say that um, I actually do a lot of work with high school students, and we use some of our lesson plans with the high school students to teach them um, astronomy concepts. Um, I think I've used some of the lessons even in the classroom <laughs> with college age college students. students. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they're designed around fun, so they're really age independent. I mean. The limiting yeah. factor is things that little hands can do and do safely. Um, but, you know, that scales up to older kids. Um, when you work with the older kids, um, you generally, you know, you want to push them a little bit harder. We haven't really mastered the skill of, of doing sort of a multi-level classroom type experience. We do some events. Um, like public events where we'll have kids of different ages. And so we're still working on mastering how to, you know, sub-tailor an event to different right. parts. Yeah. Um, 
Um, I mean, I thought, I think we did outreach at one middle school, didn't we? Or is, was that, no, I guess not. I guess we haven't done middle school so much. We see I've done some of these activities before with, so like for com example, the, the comment models, I've done that, it's sort of just yeah. normal open houses where there have been people of all ages and that always goes over really well. Um, I mean, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I think everyone is sort of a, a, a kid at heart anyway. So. Yeah. I, I've definitely taken taken some of these activities to adult-only events, uh, sometimes slightly inebriated adult-only events, um, and, and they go over just as well, which may or may not have to do with the alcohol. Uh, but the Comet one in particular is, is a popular yeah. popular one yeah. with adults and kids. And I've seen these also like the pocket model solar system. I've seen that done with high school students. Um, oh. And yeah, that goes over just as well. I mean. It, it's not just kids that are amazed by this kind of stuff, right? And so, so anytime you do something like that, you're gonna, I think, have a good, uh, have an impact. Yeah, I, I would say that the main thing that changes with age group is how much they actually learn about the underlying science, because all the age groups get pretty much equally excited with these these activities, no matter. Uh, so, I mean, the, the excitement is sort of independent of age, but to what depth you explain, you know, these are the various components of, of you know a comet, and this is what's you know, or or you know. You know, here's the the scale of the solar system. You know, how would that compare to you know your if we made a planet this size? Has so anyway, th there's different levels that you can look and learn from each of these activities. But the underlying excitement is still there regardless of what age group it's done with. So, the so wildest experience. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to mention the one where we scared the administrators at Yancey. <laughs> I love that one. Um, Please tell it. <laughs> well, so so um, with our comet activities, we use dry ice, um, and you know, in order to, to explain what's going on with sublimation, you know, you have to explain how you know something, you know, you have this solid thing and it's turning into a gas. And so one thing you can do is you can take a small twenty ounce bottle of soda. Okay, wait, 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 wait! Do not try this at home. Yeah. Only <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> okay, continue. It can actually hurt you. It can hurt you. Um, but. <clears throat> Yes. <laughs> yes. Someone with a whiskey bottle who I will not name. Okay, continue. Yeah, anyway, so you take this soda bottle, you fill it with, uh, well, not fill it, but you put in some dry ice and some water, then you close it off, and you make sure that you get everyone to a very safe distance, and, you know, solid turns into gas, gas increases pressure, bottle goes boom. Um, and so at one point, so uh, we did this, and uh, one of the administrators came over to make sure we were all I okay. I believe it was the principal of the school. I do believe it was the principal. <laughs> okay. And um, so they have these radios at the school, and so she radioed back to, to, the, to the, the, the administration or whatever. Uh, it's okay. It's just astronomy club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the teachers really thought there was a gunshot outside the school, and so she came to see what was going it's on. It's wild. It yeah. It's uh, just astronomy club. Yeah, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Um, a little bit wild and crazy we're, stuff. We're, we're a little bit mythbusters. It's we, it's fun. Yeah, we let the kids sort of do whatever they want. We're, we're very lax with the discipline that they normally have, and, it, and it, sometimes it disturbs the, the school administrators. <laughs> yeah. But in that um, case, we had the kids at a safe distance. Yes. And do not try this at home. Yes, do not try this at home, indeed. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> or anywhere. As the mythbusters say. Yeah. We're what you call experts. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that we just look like we know what we're doing, even though we're making up as we go along. Even though we don't have lab coats. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I thought, of, so, so I'll chime in with another, I guess, kind of crazy story. It's not that crazy. But um, I guess it was, it was at, there was a time at Yancey, I wasn't actually there, but um, we were doing the, the Coke and Mentos um, thing. So you put the, the Mentos in the Coke bottle and then the coke comes um, spewing out. And I guess somebody, I think it was Ian, um, managed to cap it before all the soda came out and then threw it on the ground and the pop, the, the cap popped off and so it turned into a rocket, but there was an uncontrolled <laughs> rocket. It's on YouTube. Back. I'm uh, getting is it, is it YouTube? Yeah, yeah. We have video of this. That's right. Yeah. yeah no, and I think so he's the only one who can successfully do it because yeah, I, so, so I tried to and I got a face full of soda. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that was my story. We tried to do this again, and so I was the person who was going to try and, oh, and, and get all the Mentos in and the cap on before it uh, it went everywhere, and I was not successful. Um, <laughs> Is that but, a video? But one of the students had made a poncho for me out of the trash bag, so only my face, arms, and legs were covered in soda, 
what, but my torso was totally fine, and my DSPK shirt was fine, so I guess that's the important part. But so I got a face full of soda, and the kids, but the kids love that because I got messy, and so that's, yes. that, that's fun for them, I guess. Uh, it was fun for me, too. Who am I kidding? Yeah. Didn't the cat bust off and hit you in the eye one? I think I have photos of, of me or Ryan? Ryan. I'm pretty sure. It may have. I don't remember that specifically. Okay. I definitely got a bunch of soda in the face. There may wear a little bit of cap in there as well. Um, oh my god. Yeah. Rachel, any, any craziness you want to share? Um, well, one thing that we like to do uh, when, when the kids come out of the school day, they're pretty wound up. So one of our regular <coughs> things that we do is called wiggle time. How about not think um, that? And that's basically when we come up with mildly scientifically motivated um, activities that involve the kids running many, many laps around the school or track. Um, and it's sort of remarkable because some of the students can keep themselves together. You're standing there with them and, and they're like, well, can, I go, can I go play now? And you're like, of course you can go play now. And then this kid turned around, took one step out the door, screamed at the top of his lungs and ran off at full speed. And right before that, he was this perfectly like <laughs> controlled child. But if you go out and play with them, I, it's, it's exhausting. It, yeah. It's incredibly exhausting, and I'll have like ten of them on your back right. or something. Which, like. it, which is which is why yeah we have multiple people so that the person who does the wiggle time can get their wiggles out so everyone else can they're <laughs> not wiggling when we're trying to teach them various things that need them to sit still. You're <laughs> saying that because it was usually you. <laughs> Usually I think Paul Ryan too also Ryan. got stuck with wiggle time. Yeah, I think Paul and I were the designated wiggle wiggle time. I don't know what we would call that wigglies wigglers. Climbers. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. yeah. Everything pretty much devolves into blob tag eventually. Well, yeah. yeah and we basically that. model accretion with children. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but some of them have never done blob tag before, so you have to actually explain the rules. I hadn't either. And so um, <laughs> Paul has invented most of our wiggle time activities, and before he moves on to his next um, position, which will be out in California, we're having him write up all his wiggle time activities, and we want to put them on the website. So. Hopefully soon we'll have all these outdoor scientifically, mildly, mildly science, scientifically, scientifically related, related. <laughs> um, outdoor activities um, online. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I don't know if I have any wild stories to share, but I do love when um, we do the comet demo. We send the children home with basically bags of dirt because all their dry highs is sublimated away and full of sugar because we did the edible comet and yet the parents keep sending them back. <laughs> I, I, that, that I think is proof of, of that our program works. Uh, we send them home with dirt and full of sugar and the parents don't hate us. So. There have been some good times with the IR camera <gasps> and, and the ice cubes and you can paint yourself with the ice cube and then students will paint somebody who's sitting in front of the camera with ice cubes. I think there's a picture of that online. Somebody with with all these little blue spots on them because they've been doused with yeah. ice water in various places. and It looks messy. It's just water, but it looks messy in the, in the uh, thermal infrared. So. We also will bring large containers of liquid nitrogen um, and a number of things that are fun to smash once they've been frozen with liquid nitrogen. Yes. <laughs> but we turn it into a vet because the students actually vote on, wh on whether they think it will squish, smash, or splat. Or we'll have balloons that we freeze and yes. and it let so that means when you put a balloon in liquid nitrogen it shrinks because the air either liquefies or compacts or both um, and so what we do is we, we let them they each get a balloon and it's a contest to see which one lasts the most number of <laughs> dips until it explodes it's a way that they can have fun with liquid nitrogen without actually having to interact with it themselves so we keep them at a safe distance while, while we let them vote on those yes well, most people don't have access to liquid nitrogen store anyway. Right, but even though it's cheaper than milk. It, or <laughs> than gasoline. Yeah. Well, everything's cheaper than gasoline. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, I think that is all we have for questions. Uh, I want to thank Ryan and Rachel and Paul for joining me for this Science Hour chat about uh, Dark Skies, Bright Kids. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please thumbs up or like or whatever they got going on there these days. Um, plus one us on Google Plus if you're watching. And uh, I miss you guys. Thank you for, for chatting about yeah. this fantastic program. Yeah, it was good seeing everyone. Indeed. Yeah, we miss you, Ryan. You're up in Canada. Yeah. Have you started? Having fun up here. Hey. What's
What did you say, Richard? Sometimes, yes. I think I actually have said A on a couple occasions. It slipped in there. He's officially Canadian. Not to be totally stereotypical or anything like that. <laughs> oh, no, never. I would never do that. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. All right, well, thank you, guys. Yep, thank you, Nicole. Bye, right. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks, for everyone, for watching.